Okay. Um, hi and welcome. Uh, my name is Lindsay Leader, and we are grateful for the opportunity to discuss how to stay healthy, cope, and thrive during this very challenging time. Um, a few logistics here. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. All those who registered will get a link to access the webinar at any time. You do not need to be a Vera patient in order to access the content. Um, please use the chat for questions or comments throughout the presentation. All attendees are muted um, and we find that the chat will be really helpful. At certain points during this webinar, we will be inviting the audience to participate through some anonymous survey questions via text. Um, we believe there's a lot we can learn from each other through this discussion. Uh, please participate at your comfort level. It's completely optional. If you would like to participate, go ahead and right now text the word VERA, V-E-R-A, to the number 22333. This gets you set up to participate in those polls. You only need to text it once. So if you text it now, you do not need to text it again when the questions actually arise. And then you can respond when prompted. Um, so again, welcome. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Lindsay Leader. I am a family nurse practitioner and clinical consultant with Vera. I'm joined today by Sheridan Bryant, a nationally board certified health and wellness coach and coaching manager at Vera, as well as Marcy Hamrick, one of our lead providers, who uh, our lead physician, who works with the Seattle firefighters um, who are serving on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, during this webinar, we will provide a brief overview of COVID and what we know today, but then more deeply explore how we can really nurture our physical, social, and emotional health during this very unusual time. The audience is comprised of a very diverse group, and I want to acknowledge that we all come to this with varying degrees of experience and resources, um, all being affected in unique ways through this illness and crisis. Um, we also understand that there's a plethora of information out there right now, and everyone is being inundated with advice and recommendations. So thank you for this time uh, to more deeply explore this topic in particular. We understand that there's an element of coping, which is to get through this, but that there could be opportunities also to thrive and grow and evolve through this circumstance. We feel it is critical right now to prioritize self-care and personal health so that we can better care for our loved ones and our local and global communities. Um, this is not always easy to do, even when we're not in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and particularly now, it's challenging when so many of our personal practices and resources have changed. Um, we hope that this serves as a resource that you can return to and draw from whenever it works for you. Uh, we will be offering our insights, but we really look to also learn from you as we move along in our time together. So with that, I will turn it over to Marcy. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Lin as Lindsay said, is Dr. Marcy Hamrick. I'm a family doc and I work with Seattle's firefighters, so I've been fielding a lot of questions from them about this topic. And I'm happy to be here today to share some of that information with you all. And thanks for making the time to participate in this webinar, especially at this time, like Lindsay said, that we're being completely bombarded with information about this virus. I'm reading new things about it every day and it, trying to keep up with the research and recommendations. But the fact is that the information is changing so quickly and research is just trying to keep pace. So what we know about it right now might be different from what we know about it even at the end of this webinar, which is why we keep hearing conflicting information. And that's unsettling and confusing. In this world of uncertainty though, you can at least learn to manage the amount of information by finding a few resources of reliable science-based information and trying to stick to those resources. I personally recommend the CDC website and you'll see on the slide here, the CDC website um, and your state's local health department. It's also important right now to focus on those things that we have some control over like how to stay healthy as best we can, and how to cope with the changes in our lives, perhaps even finding opportunities to learn new ways of thriving during this very strange time. So I'm gonna start by level setting a bit about this illness, and, and then we'll move into ways to cope in the, a healthy way. So this picture is uh, coronavirus. Uh, perhaps you've seen this picture a few times in the past few weeks. This family of viruses is not actually new. 
Uh, it's one of many causes of the common cold historically, but this particular strain of the virus referred to as SARS coronavirus 2 has not ever been seen in humans before. So it's a novel strain, but not a new virus. In general, once our immune systems have seen a pathogen, we have some protection against it. We build so-called herd immunity. This virus though, unfortunately, is different enough that it's gonna take some time to build that herd immunity. The other thing is that this novel coronavirus is also highly contagious, which is contributing to the rapid spread of the disease. As you may remember, there were epidemics of SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. And these are also examples of outbreaks of coronaviruses. But these strains were not as contagious as the one we're currently experiencing, but they were a lot more deadly. So COVID-19 is the term we use to describe the illness or the disease that's caused by this new coronavirus. What do you think is the most common symptom of COVID? It may surprise you, but it's not actually cough. I feel like we hear a lot about, about coughing, but it's actually fever. 99% of people who are sick with COVID report a fever of 100.5 or more. And only about 60 to 70% actually report a cough. So general viral symptoms like fatigue, loss of appetite, muscle aches are actually more common symptoms than shortness of breath. So why is this? When our bodies are exposed to a virus, our immune system mounts a response to help fight it off. And it's the inflammation that's created by this immune response that causes these symptoms of fever and fatigue and aches and whatnot. Most people, fortunately, like 80% of people of, with COVID will have either no symptoms or only mild flu-like symptoms. And then the virus runs its course and it resolves. In some people though, the inflammatory response is so great that it now causes more significant symptoms and more lung specific symptoms, such as cough and maybe some shortness of breath. In about five to 10%, so pretty low, low percent of people with COVID, the inflammatory response and lung damage is so significant that these people need to be hospitalized, given oxygen or ventilator support, and may even die. Now, who's more likely to get severely ill with this disease? Older age appears to be a risk factor. But interestingly, new research is actually suggesting that it's those people with underlying medical conditions that are the, at the most significant risk. People with conditions like chronic lung or cardiac vascular disease, diabetes, or conditions that impair the immune system. So how do you get COVID-19? How is it spread? We're still learning a lot about this. The virus lives primarily in the respiratory tract. And to spread, it has to get from one person's respiratory tract to another person's respiratory tract. So this can happen directly through close exposures to coughs or sneezes, or romantically sharing saliva. These are all sort of obvious ways of spreading. What's less obvious is the indirect exposure. When someone's saliva is on their hands and then on surfaces like doorknobs, and the virus can live for hours or even days on these surfaces, and then someone else comes along and touches that surface and then touches their face. So based on these general pathways of spread, the CDC has has come up with recommendations as to how best to prevent spreading it. Staying six feet away from people and avoiding public areas seems uh, like a very good thing to do. Wearing something to cover your nose and mouth when you're out in public. Washing your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, singing the birthday song. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth with unwashed hands. And sometimes wearing a mask can help keep you from touching your face. Um, staying at home, absolutely staying at home if you're sick, and then covering your coughs and sneezes. It's important for the good of everyone to take these recommendations really seriously. And something that we've recently learned that a decent number of people with COVID are completely asymptomatic and don't even know they have the infection and can spread it. So it's particularly important for that reason to heed these recommendations. So what do you do if you start to feel sick during this time, other than feel nervous about it? It depends. 
If you have mild symptoms similar to other flu-like illnesses you've had before, it's recommended to just stay at home, take care of yourself, get lots of rest, stay hydrated, support your immune system, and treat bothersome symptoms like fever with over-the-counter medications. If you have a cough, any shortness of breath, fever that doesn't come down easily with medications, now it's important to call your healthcare provider to discuss your situation. If you have any symptoms of more severe illness, like trouble breathing, you should absolutely call 911 right away. So question, if you have really mild symptoms of fatigue and fever, should you hang out with your roommate? This is an important point. Regardless of the severity of the symptoms you have, you need to protect others by isolating yourself. You may be able to get through the infection without much of a problem for yourself, but others who you might expose may be vulnerable to more serious complications, so it's important to protect them. You can read and learn about these symptoms as much as you want to on the internet, but it can be difficult sometimes to know in your particular situation what's best to do. Like if you're a mom to two young kids at home and you start to feel sick, what do you do? Or if you're someone with diabetes and heart disease and you start to feel short of breath, what do you do then? Many clinics, including our care centers, are now offering phone and video visits. So a healthcare provider can listen to your unique situation and advise you about what's best to do. So if you're sick, before getting in the car to go somewhere, it's important to contact your healthcare provider first by phone or video. Do know that healthcare facilities everywhere are working to protect their patients and staff. So everyone is wearing masks and other PPE, as you see in this picture of these healthcare practitioners, um, and they're practicing strict isolation and hygiene practices. Telemedicine visits are now being used more commonly, and due to large call volume, there may be long wait times for your video visit. But your situation can often be managed safely from home, and you can get good advice this way. So let's say you hear that someone you know was diagnosed with COVID. Until that moment, you thought your nasal congestion and a little bit of cough was just your allergies. But now you're sort of wondering, you're getting a little nervous. So this brings us to the question of COVID testing. In an ideal world, anyone with symptoms would get tested for COVID and they'd know for sure if they have it or not. It's totally reasonable to want testing, especially if you have symptoms that might be COVID infection. However, there are some risks and benefits of being tested. The risks include having to leave your house while you're sick. Another problem is that the availability of testing is sometimes limited in, in many areas. And the test itself is pretty miserable and involves a swab inserted deeper in your nose than you ever thought possible. The benefit of testing, though, is preventing exposure to your contacts with, if you're COVID positive. But unfortunately, in the absence of any effective treatment, and there's not at this point, testing may or may not change the recommendations for your care. Interestingly, there are a few COVID tests on the horizon, which may help increase the availability and ease of testing. One is a rapid test using a nasal swab that can give you results in like 10 or 15 minutes. Another test that uses a drop of blood, uh, but you can potentially do it at home. Again, on the horizon. The recommendations around testing are constantly changing and evolving, and they will continue to do so. So the decision is to test is worthy of being mindful about and discussing with your healthcare provider what's best for you. So I've spoken briefly about, about COVID, and I'm available to answer questions about it at the end of the webinar. But again, I do recommend if you're interested in more information to, to look at that CDC website. It's, um, it's constantly updated and, and quite scientifically accurate. So take a look at it, and then back to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Marcy. So um, a lot of the information that Marcy shared, I'm sure, are things that we've all heard. Um, and these things bring up stress and worry and anxiety. And even if you are not uh, worried or stressed about anything right now, um, we know that probably, most likely, your community in some way, shape, or form is experiencing some level of fear or worry or anxiety, whether it's the family members, whether it's people you work with, or people within your social networks. So now, um, this is the first official survey. So if you haven't already and you would like to participate, 
go ahead and text the word Vera to the number 22333 to join in. And in one word, what worries you right now? So you can see as people are responding, there's a variety of worries, economic worries, family, health of individuals, personal health, food, uh, the market, the timing of this, so many unknowns. Thank you for, for sharing. And the reason that we, we do this is that there's power in naming these things. As we get in now to how we can cope and thrive, we know that the first thing we have to do is really name what is top of mind in terms of worry and stress. And so now I'll turn it over to Sheridan to talk a little bit more about how we can really practice whole health at home. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, so I'm Sharon Bryant, and I'm actually going to partner with Marcy to talk about whole health at home. Uh, so many of you likely had some sort of routine or approach to care for yourself before COVID that has had to adjust. And there are many things out there that are out of our control and that we're really uncertain about. And so during these times of stress, we tend not to focus on ourselves and our health when it's actually a crucial time to do so, so that we can build up that resiliency and get back and get through this. Um, so there are lots of tips and tricks to be healthy during this time, um, but it does require some creativity, some flexibility and, and adaptability to do so. And I like to think of this as an experiment. So we have to try things out to see how they work. And, and if it doesn't work, we might have to change our approach until we come up with the right formula that fits for us. Um, and in coaching, we really call this trial and correction. So we wanted to share some ideas on how you can continue to care for yourself at home in relation to your social, emotional, and physical well-being. Um, but I do want to acknowledge there's 231 people that are unique um, and have unique situations and experiences, um, yet we are all united by one thing, which is COVID-19. So we are all in this together, and we can learn from each other. So if you do have any tools or tips that you want to share with the group, feel free to chat that along the way. So first off, we'll start talking about the social part. So we are social creatures. We are not meant to be isolated and alone. We are meant to be connected with each other and, and that's how we grow. Um, and when we feel connected, we thrive. And when we feel alone, we don't. Uh, and it also the quality of our relationships is really essential to our health. So how do we do this with isolation? Um, how do we do this with social distancing where we're not allowed to gather the way that we used to and we have to shift our perspective of it? Um, so one of the really key components is making sure you're surrounding yourself with those who, uh, with healthy connection, um, figuring out who are those three to five people that you can really reach out to on a regular basis to stay connected and be energized by. Um, maybe thinking of that person you can vent to with no judgment or the person that was a good listener, um, somebody that can make you laugh and have fun or give you some ideas. Um, and nowadays staying connected is is easier than ever with technology. So phone calls, video chats, people are coming up with healthy hour, happy hour, any sort of hour you can think of for connection. Um, so taking advantage of that and figuring out what works for that core group. Um, I also want to acknowledge that some people are isolated alone while others are isolated in a group. I have three other humans in my house. So, so I go into the whole group situation. And, and what can really help with that is sitting down with who you're isolated with and talking about the situation and how you want to approach it, um, coming up with ways to be creative together, um, whether that's coming up with projects, games, thinking of making your house your playground, um, and things that you probably wouldn't normally do in your house. Um, but also asking for alone time, it's really important to have that space, even if it's just five minutes in the morning and then evening, 
um, just giving yourself that time to decompress can be really helpful for not only yourself, but actually your relationship. Um, it might sound silly, but coming up with some code words or signals, so let's tell somebody like, hey, I need some space, um, can really be helpful for that to set expectations. Uh, and then developing those routines, especially if you have kids, uh, there's a lot of unnormal things going on right now and developing routines will actually allow for some normalcy during this time. So I am really curious about what tools that you guys actually use to stay connected. So you can use the same text that you already submitted um, and you can share what are the things that you have been doing to stay connected with the people and the things that you care about. Yes, see a lot of virtual people are wanting to physically see people. Photos, oh, that's great, yes. Yeah, people have lots of ideas out there and, it, and um, I see a lot of FaceTime, calling your family, picking up your phone, yes, usually we ignore that. So that's great, picking up your phone more often. So as you can see here, there's a lot of different ideas out there in order to stay connected in this time. So the, the next thing I, I want to cue in is um, talking about our emotional health. So emotional health is the inward work we do on ourselves um, to help us healthily manage our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, so people who have the tools to cope with life challenges are able to put things into perspective and able to bounce back from setbacks. So COVID-19 is both, it's a huge challenge in our lives and it's gonna be a setback. So developing our tools for our emotional health are really key at this time. Um, and one of the, the, one of the first steps is self-awareness, like just really tuning in with yourself and then being aware of what's going on internally. So by noticing emotions and naming them, um, like Lindsay mentioned at the beginning, there's a power in naming them. Um, though that's a really great tool to use. And by labeling emotions, we can create distance between ourselves and our experiences to allow an opportunity to choose how we want to respond to challenges. We can't not we can't control our emotions. It's part of the package of being human. Uh, we're always going to have those emotions, but if we learn how to identify them and pause, we have a better opportunity of deciding what we want to do with that. And if we want to keep that feeling or if we need to let it go. Um, and if, and that's, and if we want to let it go, then it's a time to think about like, what do I need to do in order to do that? So a couple tools that are useful to use is, is one is shifting your perspective. So instead of being like, oh my gosh, I can't stand being in this house anymore, um, taking a pause and being like, okay, I haven't been in my house for this long and so many times. I have all these projects that I can do. So thinking of it as more of an opportunity can help you be a little bit more positive about it. Um, also grounding yourself and being in the present moment. Um, I really like the acronym WIN, What is Important Now by John Cooper. This reminds me to focus on my current feelings and actions. So that way I don't spin into the what ifs from the past or the, the what could happen in the future and allows me to be really present on the thing I can control. And then if you shift from self-awareness to self-care, uh, so self-care is anything you can deliberately do to energize you mentally and physically. Um, and, you know, it kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. People think of self-care as being selfish um, or woo-woo stuff, but really, you can't really care for others the way you want to unless you care for yourself. Um, so reframing this time as a, or this opportunity to invest in yourself, um, how much time are you spending saving by not commuting or doing after school activities or after work activities, and really thinking of how you can bring that to yourself to care for yourself. Um, so really self-care can be anything that brings you joy, taking a bubble bath, reading a book, sitting on your porch, going for a walk. So really just thinking of the things that you really enjoy that you can do in this moment. Um, there's also mindfulness practices that you can adapt. There's uh, meditation um, or gratitude practices that can be routine. Um, you can also just do the, try to find moments in your day to be present with yourself. Um, and if you're feeling a little anxious or worried, a good tool is just to stop breathe, 
and observe, um, that allows you to realize you're okay in this moment and also allows you to alleviate that emotion. You, also, another great time to be mindful is when you're washing those hands for that 20 to 30 seconds, being really present with that. Um, my personal favorite is developing cues to anchor me in the present. So if my phone rings, I take a breath. Um, and my golden nugget at that, this time is taking three de deep breaths every time my eight-year-old says, can I ask you a question? And it's like the 10th time that day. Um, and so it might be a little odd to her that I'm taking these breaths, but what she doesn't know is that I'm actually checking in with myself so that my reaction isn't, no, I don't have time, but it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be, I know that you want my attention right now. Please give me five minutes and I, uh, and then I'll be happy to answer your questions. So that allows me to validate her needs and feelings, um, but set some boundaries and then not make me feel bad about my reaction in that moment too. Um, another component is going to be self-care, or sorry, self-compassion. Uh, so be kind to yourself. This is a really, really bizarre time. So really learning how to give yourself some grace. We're, nobody knows how to deal with this right now. And so being kind to yourself if you have a bad reaction. Um, if you want to learn some tools about self-compassion, Kristen Neff is, has done so much research on that, and she has some really good tools out there. Um, and I also want to express, like, please ask for help when you need it, whether that's personal or professional. Uh, there is a lot of behavioral health platforms that you can do virtual now. Um, and many people know what to do or what they should be doing, but, but it's hard to put into action sometimes. So at our care centers, we offer health coaching and our health coaches help people navigate change, the changes they wanna make and put into action. And, and we're doing this over the phone. So there are opportunities like that out there. You just gotta do some digging. Um, and I can't express enough. Just remember you are not alone um, and, and we're all in this together and you can reach out. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Marcy to talk about physical health. Great, thanks Sheridan. So we all know that, that we're healthier in body and mind and spirit when we're eating healthy foods, getting enough sleep and getting some physical activity. But when we're under stress and our usual routine has gone out the window, it gets really hard to do. First, I think it's important if this staying at home business has caused you to ditch your healthy habits altogether, that it's important to practice that self-compassion that Sheridan just talked about and know that it's often really normal to go into survival mode during times like this. But as the initial fear and panic reduce a little bit, it's time to think about how best to take care of ourselves emotionally, socially, and physically. In terms of food, I think it's especially important right now to create a routine around eating. So you're not eating too often or not enough. When you do go out and get groceries or order them online, try to buy things with the attitude that you wanna take care of yourself, especially right now. But don't forget also to get some kind of healthy things that feel like a treat, like maybe some dark chocolate. Now is a great time to try your hand at cooking if it's something that you don't normally do or cook something that's new or takes a lot of time, like baking bread or making pasta from scratch. You could share recipes with your friends about with meals that they enjoy, um, or use this time as an opportunity to be creative in the, in the kitchen. Um, look up recipes using your favorite ingredients, or maybe play Chopped. I have some friends who've played uh, the game Chopped with their friends virtually, creating a meal out of what few ingredients you may have in your kitchen. In terms of sleep, we know that good sleep is a really strong factor in good health. It supports our mood and our brain health and our immune system. So again, our, our sleep often gets disrupted when we're feeling stress and our lives are totally chaotic. So things we know are, that are helpful around sleep, definitely having a sleep schedule, like trying to go to sleep and wake up at around the same time. Also really important is having a period of like a wind down time and during that time, like turning down the lights, um, restricting your access to news, I think is really important. Um, reducing your use of screens and monitors. And then during the day, trying to get exercise and avoiding or reducing your use of caffeine and alcohol, we know is also helpful for sleep. So again, this strange time can be seen as an opportunity to try some new things, like maybe a, a guided relaxation on an app. Um, there's some apps like Headspace or Calm, which we include in the resources at the end of this webinar. Or try creating a new bed 
time routine with sleepy time tea and rubbing your feet with lavender scented lotion or taking a warm bath or maybe reading a book instead of looking at the news on your phone. So sleep is often better when your room is nice and cool and dark and quiet. So also creating a good sleeping environment is something to think about if you're having trouble with sleep right now. And then finally, physical activity. I always tell people that the best exercise that they can do is the one they will actually do. So if you're normally a gym person, but it's closed, or if you aren't used to having time to exercise, here's your time for getting creative. Maybe walk around your neighborhood, get some fresh air. Being in nature we know is really healing. Even dancing in your living room to your favorite song or using it any of a number of online exercise programs that again, we've included in the resources at the end of this webinar. Maybe this is a great time for gardening or going for a bike ride. It can be helpful to set goals for yourself um, or with a friend um, so that you can feel accountable to your goals. Um, so I encourage you to maybe think about doing that as well as a way of um, being accountable to your self-care goals. So now we'll do another uh, poll question. So in the past week, what's one thing that you've done to care for yourself? So if you can text those ideas and things, experiences that you have into that text line or the chat, I would love to hear. Lots of yoga and meditation. I love the facials and nails. Exercise, sleep. Go on a distance run. I just signed up for a social distance run. That's available online. If you guys are interested in that. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of those great ideas. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to share with you a simple mindfulness practice. Um, so think of it as that 30 seconds of self-care. Uh, so go ahead and, and take a breath and, and just notice how you're feeling right now. Uh, and, and I will guide you through this practice. So stop and ask yourself, where is my attention? Notice, is it on a thought? Is it in the past? Is it in the present? Gather your intention inward and place it on your breath. We'll pause together for 15 seconds. Take one more deep inhale and fully exhale. And when you're ready, open your eyes. And, and maybe take a second to notice how do you feel now after that practice? Great, thank you, Sheridan. So as Sheridan just led you through a mindfulness practice, um, our idea with that is that that's one example and we really wanted you to walk away from this with large broad ideas, but also some concrete tools. So please feel free to use that mindfulness moment as one tool in your toolbox. Another one that um, could be useful and perhaps this is something you do every day or perhaps this is something you do once and you post it somewhere in your house is to complete the following sentences. Today I feel Today, I thrive by. Today, I commit to. And right now, for our last survey, I would ask you all, if you're comfortable, to complete this sentence. Today, I commit to. And so what I think is so 
moving about these as, as people are writing in is to understand that we have our own habits and practices, but there's so much we can learn from our community, you know. Um, I love this, you know, take, take time without my phone, kiss my husband, but give myself grace, exercise, be present in the moment, um, get in the sun. So these things that even in the midst of not having a lot of control, what can we have control over and what can we access right now? So thank you. Um, so we have included a list of resources um, in the areas of cooking, meditation, yoga, and exercise, and a few more on the next page. And various um, resources are virtual, you know, access to various things online. I also want to call out, as Marcy mentioned, you know, if you're used to going someplace for your movement, for your exercise, how can you use your immediate surroundings right now? Um, perhaps it's, I can't get to the gym to run on the treadmill or do the track, but you could use your neighborhood block as a track or you find some stairs or a hill and you climb them and you set goals and you cross off those goals. Also check out your local studios um, for what they're offering if, if um, you're not able to get there, obviously. Um, also some social resources, sleep resources and tips, outdoor ideas, and then um, activities and resources for kids. So again, this will be posted so you can reference this. You don't have to write it all down. So, Thank you so much for your time. And now we have um, about 10 minutes for some questions and discussions. And I've already had some that have come through the chat. And the first one I'll direct to Marcy. Um, so Marcy, can you share a bit more about how this virus is living on uh, surfaces and or provide resources for that and how best to protect ourselves? Yeah, so there is information about this on the CDC website. Um, They've been doing research on different surfaces like glass and cardboard and metal and fabric. And uh, I, I, it is one of those areas where I feel like there is some conflicting information because the research is actively being done. So I can't say with certainty uh, around those time periods, but that information is being up, updated on the CDC website and is different for each kind of surface. And unfortunately, it is looking, research is supporting that, that things, um, that the virus is staying on, particularly some resources like, um, or surfaces like metal for several days, which just makes it that much more important to protect ourselves by, by staying at home as much as we can and not touching things that other people have touched. So the recommendations for protecting yourself are kind of the same, but it just makes it that much more important. Great, okay, thank you. Um, another question for you, um, do, does wearing gloves really protect us? I think that if we wear gloves while we're out in public, like going grocery shopping, for instance, and then we remove the gloves as soon as we leave that area and, wa and wash our hands and don't touch our face while wearing those gloves um, or before washing our hands, then yes, the gloves can certainly be protective. Okay. Um, another question, and I think there is a lot of confusion about this because we don't know who has been exposed and who's had confirmed cases, is really around isolation. So how long do I really have to isolate after being exposed to someone positive? And I know the CDC has offered recommendations around that, so I'll let you respond. Yeah, I think in general, um, the recommendation is to isolate or quarantine yourself for 14 days. And that's based on the, what we know about the incubation period for the virus. So the incubation period or the time between being exposed and developing illness is somewhere between two and 14 days with the average being about five days. Um, but if at 14 days you don't have any symptoms of it, then most likely you have not actually contracted it and you don't need to continue isolating yourself from your household. Um, and then there's a few more questions around wearing, should we be wearing masks outside and should we be wiping down things like groceries? Yeah, so I know the, the recommendation is to wear a mask at all, all times when you're in, when you're in public. Um, I think it's unclear whether you need to wear a mask if you're taking a walk in your neighborhood. Um, there's some research on the, the risk of aerosolized exposure, meaning the virus in the in the air as opposed to droplets from coughing and sneezing. And it seems like the, the, the risk of exposure from 
air is far less than, than that of droplets. Um, certainly, if you're going somewhere where there are other people, uh, it is important to wear a mask then. Uh, if you're taking a walk by yourself in your neighborhood and are staying at least six feet away from other people, I, I, I don't know that that is entirely necessary if you're outdoors. If you're indoors, and around other people, absolutely, it is important to wear something, uh, a mask or a bandana or a t-shirt. All of those things have been shown to be helpful. Great. And then um, as a piggyback to that, someone just wrote in, as a first responder, I have to visit homes. Should I change my mask between homes? Sorry, I didn't hear the question very well. Um, as a first responder, I have to enter into people's homes. Should I change my mask in between? Ideally, if resources are, are, are adequate, then yes, it is recommended to change your mask between entering different people's homes. Okay. And then um, just a couple more for you, Marcy. <laughs> if uh, someone is asymptomatic, how long do they carry the virus? And also, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the CDC's recommendation to have thermometers in the workplace or to check temperature? So um, if you're asymptomatic, but test positive, it's thought that after seven days after being tested that you're no longer contagious to other people. Um, so that's the, it's the seven, seven days is what's the, the current thought. Um, and in terms of thermometer use for workplaces, I think that is just to ensure that uh, because fever is experienced in 99% of people who test positive for COVID, they're, they're just using that as a tool to reduce the risk of someone with COVID but doesn't have any other symptoms maybe or doesn't know they have a fever from entering a, a place where they could expose other people. Okay. And then should we be wiping down groceries or objects that we're getting in the mail? You know, I've heard, I've heard it's one of those things that I've heard very conflicting things about. Um, um, I, I would look at the CDC website to, to see what their recommendations are at this time. The last time I, I looked at it, uh, it did not recommend, I mean, certainly um, uh, grocery, grocery stores and retailers are asking you not to use your own bags coming from your home into their uh, stores to help try and reduce that, that sort of spread. But, uh, and I know that groceries are being, grocery stores and retailers are being very careful about wearing gloves to try to reduce the risk of that exposure. Um, I, have, I have not heard great evidence that cleaning those items uh, reduces transmission. But I think it's an area we just don't know enough about. Thank you. And Sheridan, for you, um, uh, questions come in about school closures. You know, if, um, mm -hmm. Now that it, several schools have notified that they'll be closed for the rest of the year, do you have one or two um, just tips on how to talk to our kids about that and or um, ideas or resources for working with them through this time? Yeah, it's tough. I, we have two little girls and are going through the same thing. Um, so really just checking in with them. We ask every day, how are you feeling? Do you have any questions about this? And, and being really curious to see uh, how, what they're thinking. Mostly they're missing the social connection of their teachers and their, group, their um, friends. So trying to get them to be able to talk to their friends um, and, and validating their fears and letting them know that this is to keep them safe and, um, and, and not trying to scare them, but being honest that this is the best that we can do right now in order to protect ourselves and others. Um, there is, a, I think it's called, it's one of the resources that goes in is a, a nice resource that you can do there. And there are some books out there. I, I, it escapes me right now, but I can add it to the resources about how you can talk to your kids about really hard situations. Um, but just being real curious with them. They'll come up with the funniest things when you ask them and, and their fears um, might be completely different than you think. So just meeting them where they're at. Great question. Great. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll take one last question and then um, we will end there. Um, people can also use the email that you see here on the screen um, to ask additional questions. But Marcy, before we close, um, if you've had the virus and recovered, can you get it again? Can you talk a little bit about what we know about immunity? Yeah, it's a really great question and the subject of quite a bit of research that's happening right now. Um, it, it does seem like there's a, several mutations that have happened. So a couple different 
strains of this coronavirus that have been, that are being seen um, around the world. There have been some documented cases of individuals who've had the coronavirus illness more than once. So it is possible and with exposure, we do know there is at least partial immunity. So I guess it depends what virus, what strains of the virus you are exposed to and getting it definitely offers some at least partial immunity. So it is unlikely to get it twice. But again, more to be discovered as research continues. Great, thank you. Um, and just uh, as we close, I know we spend a lot of time talking about our own physical, social, and emotional health, and sometimes it is so overwhelming to think about how we can do things for ourselves, and I think it's important to continue to come back to the idea of that, and, and this might be actually useful for our kids as well, it's not just about taking care of ourselves, but that if we can um, sort of look at this as an opportunity by restricting ourselves as a way to take care of the world and the global community, then we're all contributing. I think that that is an important thing to uh, remember as well. So um, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we'd love to hear more from you. So if you have any follow-up questions or ideas for future webinars, please send a message to vwhwebinars at verawholehealth.com. Again, this has been recorded. We will post it, and those of you who registered will get a link to access it. So with that, we'll, we'll end, and thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks.